Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our Ocean Friendly Garden Maintenance Webinar Series. Today, we'll be talking about weeding requirements. I'm your presenter once again, Llewellyn. I'm the lead horticulturalist at Swayzer Landscapes, um, and we are currently maintaining some of the Ocean Friendly Gardens. So the thing about weeding in ocean friendly gardens is it's not too complicated. Weed science can be this whole big thing, but weed science is mostly about chemicals and herbicides. And obviously that's not a thing in ocean friendly gardens. So we're just gonna talk about what we can do. So here we go. So we'll talk about the weeding requirements for ocean friendly garden, some weed classifications, which will ultimately help us know um, you know, when we should be weeding specific types of plants. We'll talk about the weed management that we can do. Then I'll talk about some common broadleaf weeds that we have in the gardens and some common grassy weeds that we have in the gardens. So Southern California has very fertile soil. Weeds love it here. It's a great thing that we have this fertile soil because we're able to grow all kinds of crops and plants. But, you know, weeds are also going to thrive in this atmosphere. And so we do have to be mindful of the practices that we have so weeds are not thriving over our plants. So once again, ocean-friendly gardens are created to prevent contaminated water from reaching the waterways and eventually the oceans. And so if you are a landscape maintenance person, usually the first thing that comes to mind when you hear weeds is, what kind of herbicide do I need to use? Uh, let's break out the string trimmer. These are things that cannot happen at Ocean Friendly Garden. So, you know, no chemicals, no spray, no fertilizers. So we have to have alternatives for actually taking the weeds out and dealing with the weed issues that are currently there. So here's some of the criteria for weeding um, in Ocean Friendly Garden. So all landscapes should be kept weed-free at all times. Obviously, weeds are a nuisance aesthetically, but then they also can be taking from the landscape plants that are there, um, taking precious resources that are meant for the landscape plants that are there. So hand removal only. So you have to physically go out there and remove the weeds. Hand removal or using some kind of tool that can help you remove the weeds. No chemicals, so no herbicides not even organic herbicides, um, shall be used to control weeds. The use of a weed eater is not acceptable form of controlling weeds. So no string trimmers, which is the most commonly used tool by landscapers far and wide to remove weeds, but that is not something that can happen at Ocean Friendly Gardens. And weed control measures will also include the removal of volunteer plants, palms and palm seedlings. So, you know, palm seedlings are obviously a huge issue and that's something you definitely want to get on as soon as you see it because palm seedlings have the capacity to become a fully grown palm and none of the gardens have palms in them. So that's not something you want to start. So, like I said, if you are a landscaper or you run a landscape team, there's weeds, you know, grab your string trimmers, grab your herbicides, let's get to work. That's usually how it goes. But these are the two main options that we use and they're the two main options that we cannot use in ocean-friendly gardens. Um, the thing about weed eaters or string trimmers in general is that they don't really eradicate weeds anyway. Um, what they do is cut them to the ground, but lots of weeds are so tenacious that they can re-sprout from the roots that are still going to be present in the soil. And then, of course, herbicides. So we have to be mindful of what we're putting into gardens, especially if we're considering the ocean in mind. And so you spray a herbicide, you know, it's the area is watered or it rains. Obviously, that's going to get flushed down the drain and end up in the ocean eventually. So... No string trimmers, even though it's very easy and quick, and no herbicides, even though it's also pretty easy and quick to do to control weeds. Okay, so let's talk about weed classifications. So, you know, what is a weed? I know that's a very basic question, but we have to have a jumping off point. 
Um, a weed is a plant that's growing somewhere where it's not wanted. And a weed can be anything as long as it's something that you didn't want in that atmosphere. It's not a part of the plants that you desire to have there. Um, also, they will interfere with the intended use of land and water resources. So weeds are going to be taking up that water that, you know, we spend so much time determining how much water our plants need. We don't want we that water, you know, that one inch of water that we give out. We don't want that water to go to weeds. Um, and the site will determine if it's a weed or not. So here is a pretty cute weed, Scarlet Pimpernel. It looks like it can be like a nice ground cover plant, but if it was present in our gardens, um, it is a weed. So Scarlet Pimpernel, even though it has really cute flowers, um, and it looks like a nice ground cover, and it can be potentially used as a ground cover, um, it has to be removed. Also, a word about invasive plants, and so there are about 200 invasive plants. There's an inventory on the California Invasive Plant Council, um, and there's also a website called plantright.org where they will tell you the most current invasive plants, and the thing about invasive plants, there's a lot of them that, you know, are drought tolerant and would actually have characteristics that would fit them in an ocean friendly garden, but they are invasive. And so that means that they will take over all of the native plants that we have um, and pretty much outcompete them. So here are some examples. Um, ice plant, which is used a lot on the side of highways, even though it has that succulent look and it's a really dense ground cover, um, it cannot be planted. Crimson fountain grass, not the red fountain grass, but this particular one, it is invasive. And then of course, the Mexican fan palm, which is like one of the most popular trees in Southern California because of its invasive nature and its ability um, to grow from just about anything. And so a word about plant replacement once again, make sure that the plant that you choose, even if it is drop tolerant, is not on the invasive plant list because that will be a bad thing. And we do need to limit our use of these plants because there's already so many in Southern California. So why do we need to remove weeds? I've mentioned this already, but the main thing is that weeds are competing with our plants. And so not just competing for water, but also the nutrients and soils. And so especially because we are not necessarily going in there with a chemical fertilizer, um, we're depending on compost mulch and stuff like that, and compost teas, all those nutrients that we provide in the small amounts that they are provided, which are great for our ocean-friendly garden plants, they need to stay with our ocean-friendly garden plants. And so um, we need to make sure that weeds are not taking all the nutrients from the soil and they're also not taking all the moisture that's put into the soil. Weeds can also serve as a host for insect pests and pathogens, very common. Um, the weeds will be a host for the insect and then the insect will run out of the weeds it will eat the weeds to the ground and then it will move on to your plant that you desire so that's obviously a bad thing and weeds will provide cover for vertebrate pests so not so much coyotes in our gardens because the weeds never get that big but if they did maybe um you know and other things like rabbits and they can be a pest problem because they could end up eating the plants that you desire once again. So it's all about competition. It's all about, you know, not having this plant competing with the plant that you actually desire. So now we'll talk about the life cycle and seasonal classification. So there's lots and lots of weeds, um, but if you can kind of understand the life cycle and the seasonal classification, you can decide um, the best mode of action, the best time you should be looking out for these weeds, the best time you should be actively scouting for these weeds so you can get them up before um, they flower or they get any bigger. So annual weeds are split into two categories. There's winter annuals and there's summer annuals. So winter annuals will germinate in the fall, live in the winter, produce seeds in the winter and the spring. And so this is like their typical life cycle. And so, you know, the best time to look out for these plants 
obviously when we're getting close to summer, it's getting a little bit late because they will have large flowers on them. And that, that means they will have a bunch of seeds that they will eventually drop into the soil. So that's a little late. We want to get them when they are still small and juvenile and they have not produced flowers yet. And so some examples um, that may be present in your particular garden, cheese wheat, annual bluegrass, ground sorrel. And then we have summer annuals, which germinate in the spring and produce seeds in the summer or the fall. And so uh, same situation, we wanna be looking for these weeds actively, the small versions of these weeds um, closer to the time when they first germinate in the spring. Some examples um, that will be found in the garden, slams quarter, spotted spurge, crabgrass, and pigweed. So those are our annuals. And then we have biennial weeds, which generally complete their life cycles in two years. So the first year they're gonna do vegetative growth. So they're just growing more leaves and um, vegetative structures. And then the second year is when they will do their reproductive growth, which will be making a flower. And so the good thing about biennials is that you can stop them right in their tracks. Um, and you can take a little bit longer to stop them in their tracks versus annuals because you have that whole second year is when they actually flower. So you can still get them when they're in their vegetative state before they flower. And so some examples, bull thistle, mullein, um, wild carrot. These are biennial plants. And then there are some plants that will act more in a biennial fashion. So you can look out for those and I'll mention those um, when we get to them. And then we have perennials. So perennials are perhaps, you know, some of the hardest weeds to control. They live for longer than two years and they have extensive root systems. So young perennials can be controlled by cultivation, um, which is not necessarily something we can do in the gardens. But if you can, like before you put down a new layer of mulch, that's something you could look into. Um, but once they're established, they are pretty hard to eradicate. Um, so creeping perennials are going to produce, uh, reproduce by seeds and vegetative structures. And the vegetative structures are really what makes it difficult. And so this is your typical perennial weed. It'll have a very extensive root system underground, or sometimes it'll have horizontal stems above ground. But that makes it very difficult to control because even if you pull one out, there's many more and they can usually root or produce adventitious buds from their roots and put out a brand new plant. And so, you know, you're kind of something you have to constantly be doing. You're visiting these gardens once a month. So every time you go there, you have to make the most of your time by dealing with these perennials the best you can. And so the main culprit of perennial weeds in the gardens is Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass is the main weed in many places. And that's obviously because it was probably used as a turf grass in that area. And it's very, very difficult to get rid of Bermuda grass. And so once it was somewhere and it has these seeds in the soil and has these vegetative structures in the soil, um, it's hard to get rid of. But we'll talk about some ways that you can kind of get rid of it. And then wood sorrel. And so there's also another classification, broadleaf and grassy. This is very obvious to any landscape manager, I'm sure, but I wanted to bring up a point um, that there are gonna be broadleaf weeds, which are dicots, which means, you know, it's just a classification of these plants, and then monocots, um, which are the grassy weeds. And I wouldn't say either or is harder to control, but, grassy weeds, they do give you a run for your money a lot of times because, you know, they are very strong. But then there's also some dicots that can put up a really good fight. So, um, especially in the garden. So, um, all of the weeds need to be considered. So, let's talk about weed management. So, there are weeds in all the soils. So, weeds are inevitable. No matter how well you treat this garden or how well you scouted out the space to place the garden, there's gonna be weeds there because the weeds have a seed 
a soil seed bank. So weeds are already present in most soils and um, you know it's almost an indicator that the soil is healthy and thriving because it will have presence of weed seeds. And so, so there are some sources that say there are about 20 million weed seeds per acre of soil. So, you know, weeds are there. It's a part of gardening. It's not necessarily a negative thing. It's just a part of it. It's part of landscape maintenance. It's one of the main parts of landscape maintenance, especially when you're dealing with a landscape that doesn't have turf grass. Your main goal for every visit is, can I remove these weeds? Let's get rid of the weeds. So. It's a part of it. Um, and weeds are just really, really good at surviving. Um, they can come from many sources, animal droppings, mowers, plant debris, mulches. There's many times where if the mulch is not certified, it will be just loaded up with weed seeds. If you don't clean your equipment going from garden to garden, uh, you'll be transferring weed seeds. They can be very tiny. Um, and then just think about things like dandelions, how the weeds can travel for, the seeds can travel for miles and miles and plant somewhere and then there's dandelions there. So weeds are very successful and that's the reason why they are weeds. So for annuals, the objective is going to be prevent seed production and deplete the seed reserves in the soil. And so this is much, easier than it sounds, but if you are constantly on top of it and you have a program set up for yourself um, and it's something you're constantly putting effort into, it is possible. So when we say pre prevent seed production, we're talking about preventing the plant to get to the point where it actually flowers. So we want to get this wheat when it's small and it's in the juvenile stage of the plant before it flowers because once it flowers it's going to drop those seeds rather quickly and then now you have the soil with even more seeds in the seed bank that are weed seeds and so that's obviously a negative thing and then for perennials the objective is to destroy the vegetative structures and um, prevent seed production so Obviously, if you have a Bermuda grass weed, what you want to do is you want to remove as many of the stolons and rhizomes as you possibly can. But then you also want to do all of that before it gets to the point where it's flowering, because then there'll be an even larger problem. There'll be even more weeds. And so that's something to consider. Also with like sedges, which are a grass-like plant, they also have underground vegetative structures and you want to remove them and so removing the vegetative parts so the roots and making sure before they get to flowers is a goal for weeding all around and that's why we don't use string trimmers because they're not going to get rid of the roots which they can still root from and produce a brand new plant from that so when you're talking about weed management you want to take a IPM approach and so controlling weeds is going to be a continuous effort and so we would use the integrated pest management approach and it's basically a system and approach of using environmentally conscious practices and not just relying on one method to control your pests but stacking many methods to get the kind of control that you want. And so it's broken up into prevention. So in our case, that would be preventing weeds from even coming onto the property as much as we can. Sanitation, you know, cleaning the area, you know, not having excessive brush that can hide weeds or cleaning our tools in between. Um, physical methods such as making sure um, that we have boundaries and borders that are now not allowing excess weeds to come into the garden. Um, for biological, there's not a huge amount of biological control options when it comes to weeds that we can use in the gardens, because um, biological would be using another living organism to control a pest, like using ladybugs to control um, aphids or something like that. But for biological, we can think very dense shrubs, very dense ground cover that's not going to allow weeds to thrive. 
You know, the final part of the IPM triangle, which is chemicals, which is nice because no matter what garden you're working in or whatever the case, chemicals should always be the last option, which I'm sure everyone knows. Um, you try everything else first and then chemicals are the last option because we are trying to be, you know, environmentally conscious, but we don't have that option. So no chemicals at all. And so we can, there's a, enough things on this triangle that we can try all these other methods um, to figure out what we could do to get rid of our weeds. And you might have another pest. I'm not giving a webinar specifically on pest management because typically there's not a lot of pests, but if you do have a, you know, a fungal outbreak or some kind of bacteria or something like that, you can use the same triangle to figure out all the other steps you can take before you actually, um, you know, reach a threshold where you're like, well, I need to either remove this plant or see if there's something I can use on it. So the first things that we'll talk about um, are prevention, protection, and eradication. So prevention refers to methods to not have weeds on property. And so um, a lot of these things are kind of out of our hands because they need to be done beforehand, but we'll still mention them so we can upkeep what they have going for them. Um, protection, that stops unwanted weeds from either sprouting or seeding. And eradication involves all techniques to physically remove the weeds from the property. So prevention, prevention stops the weeds from coming onto the property. And so some of the ways we can do prevention are to put up a barrier. And so when we're talking about a barrier, we could use a very, very dense plant that's on the edge potentially and use that as a barrier so that the weed seeds cannot travel into the garden. And so see a note, this is a really good plant for that. Um, cleaning equipment between visits. And so even if you're just using head shears and pruners, you definitely want to clean them um, in a alcohol or a bleach solution to make sure you're getting all of the weeds out, um, all the weed seeds that are potential on the tools out of there. Also, this could be a vector for carrying different fungal spores and um, bacteria from plant to plant. So you just want to have in the practice of cleaning your tools regardless of the situation. And then going beyond the property to tackle the source of weeds. So this happens very, very often where you'll have a landscape and it'll be very, very nice, but then maybe there's a vacant lot that's next to it that's covered with weeds. And maybe the vacant lot is not your task, but that vacant lot is providing weed seeds to your garden. So perhaps you can figure out the methods of going beyond, you know, dealing with that turf grass area that's loaded with crab grass, dealing with that um, turf grass area that may be flowering a lot of Bermuda seeds, um, that can help what's going on in the garden because ultimately those seeds are going to reach the garden. So that's definitely something to consider if possible or speaking with the person who takes care of the other property. Protection, which means um, stopping weeds from germinating or spreading. And so, of course, using aggressive plants that can outcompete the weeds. And so, like I mentioned again, for a border, but also an aggressive ground cover, that would be great. Um, yarrow, so you note this. So the thing that I mentioned in pruning is that um, it's good to pinch a lot of your ground cover plants back and so they'll get more bushy and full. And this is one of the main reasons you want to do that because they'll be aggressive and then it'll be a dense bushy covering and it would be harder for weeds to germinate or grow through that. And that's definitely a goal. I have seen Bermuda grass grow through yarrow though. So Bermuda grass is definitely, you know, more aggressive, if you will. But it will help to have a planting there in general, just so, you know, something is better than nothing. And then you want to talk about cultural control. And so I think cultural control is probably one of the main things that we forget when we put into our weed control um, aspect. So cultural control would basically be to modify their environment and improve your desired plant's competitive advantage. So you want to tailor everything in your garden to the plant that you desire. 
so often we do things like overwatering um, and you know not really considering our soil and that is allowing weeds to thrive because weeds thrive in atmospheres that are you know not perfect or if there's too much water maybe the plant is not putting out as many leaves and roots as it could because it's too wet for it but that's really wet moist soil is good for weeds or a particular type of weed so um, the same goes with the opposite a really really dry soil if there's not enough water um, will give a weed a competitive advantage so Simple things, well, not simple, but soil testing is a good method. If you have a weed problem and you just, you know, feel like it's out of your range, or if you want to like start from a set point, um, what I like to do, especially when we're starting somewhere brand new, is get a soil test and figure out what's going on. What is the pH? What is the salts? What is the fertility? Um, is the soil really low fertility? Low fertility sometimes allows weeds to thrive over the desired plants high salt levels, especially if you're using recycled reclaimed water, that can allow weeds to thrive in your plants to suffer. So it's definitely something to consider. Um, and of course, irrigation management, like I mentioned, if it's too moist, if it's too dry, um, if there's plant, if there's parts, if there's um, like nozzles where there's not a plant and they're still putting out water, that's just giving the weeds an environment that they desire. So that's definitely something to look into. And then you want to reduce soil compaction. So super compacted soil uh, also allows weeds to thrive over the desired plant. So a, a very easy way to ease compaction of soil is just to simply go in there with a pitchfork and kind of move things around. Um, be careful of the drip lines, of course, but great for reducing compaction because there are some weeds that will thrive and um, you know, outcompete the plants that you want. So cultural control, I always feel like it's one that's forgotten. So I would definitely consider it overall with every landscape, but particularly these landscapes. And then there's protection. So that reason that we need all that mulch, mulch suppresses the growth by blanketing existing weeds and preventing incoming seeds from touching the soil and rooting. So using a thick layer of mulch will provide protection from weeds, protection from the seeds germinating. Um, large thick mulches are preferred over fine thin mulches and this is specifically for weed suppression. Um, and here is a compost mulch and it's kind of made up of fine and larger chunks. And so you want to use certified mulch, um, buying mulch from just anywhere. You might end up with palm seeds in it. You might end up with Bermuda grass seeds in it. So you don't want to risk it at all. So you want to find a reputable mulch dealer that um, can show you their certification papers that there is a certain amount of weed seeds that are not present so that you can be comfortable going for it because I've seen it happen where you get mulch from you know a truck somewhere and then it has palm seeds in it and you have palm seedlings germinating and that's a disaster so you don't want to do that um, and then for weed suppression there's new guidelines for weed suppression of mulch and so we typically say we want our mulch to be two to six inches if we're talking about you know just putting a layer of mulch to protect the soil but according to the um, UC Master Gardener program they want six to twelve inches of mulch depending on um, the particle size or if it's fine or if it's a large thick mulch 12 to 6 inches um, for complete weed suppression which I know is a lot of material but you want that weed suppression so that six inches on the low side will work well for that um, and then there's eradication so eradication very simply in our case since we're not talking about Chemical herbicides is simply physically removing the weeds. And so you can pull them by hand. When you pull them, make sure you're getting all of the roots as as much as the roots as possible. Um, and then you can also, I like using hula hose to remove weeds, but you could also use a regular hoe. Um, hula hose are good at you know getting under and pulling up as much as the root as possible. 
So some common eradication mistakes that people make, um, weeding after the plants have set seed. So once the plants have set seed, it's a little late in the game. And I know that sometimes it's not possible, especially when we're visiting these gardens once a month, but that's why you kind of have to be really vigilant to see like, is that a little tiny weed coming up? Okay, let me go get that one. Um, versus coming back and there's a full flower or full seed set because you know they're gonna drop into the soil or they already have and you're just gonna you're pretty much setting yourself up to do the same event in a few months so that's something you want to avoid um and also weeding a massive infestation with no plan to come back so say the garden has not been managed maybe it was over the holiday break and it's when like or something and it's been two months and you have a massive weed infestation you kind of have to maybe do two visits in that month to weed and then go back and weed again because once you remove all the things it kind of just opens up the soil some more and so some more weeds are going to start germinating and popping up and you don't want that to happen so you kind of have to go back and be on top of it so you don't um, you're not going to obviously completely eradicate all the weeds or the big infestation, but you are going to have a better control of it. And then weeding when the soil is wet. So a lot of home gardeners would actually say they prefer weeding when the soil is wet because it makes it easier to pull the roots out of it. But in our case, um, because we typically are working with crews, we don't want to weed when the soil is wet because that can lead to soil compaction. So soil compaction is obviously a cultural thing that, um, a cultural control thing that we just talked about. So that's not something we want to go in there and actively do um, or make worse. So don't weed when the soil is wet. So um, non-chemical methods for eradication, once again, it's not a whole bunch of science to it necessarily. You want to remove the annuals before they flower and then remove rhizomes and stolons of perennial weeds. So you want to make sure you get that very large tap root if you're talking about broadleaf weeds, but then you also want to make sure you're getting whatever vegetative structures of your perennial weeds. And then if we're talking about like sedges, which are also um, perennial, you also want to make sure you get the tubers. So they have these little underground structures, you know, like mini, mini potatoes, which are underground. And you want to make sure you pull those out as well, because uh, sedges are a huge weed problem if you have them. And it's, they're hard to control because of those underground structures. So if you see one, don't just pull it out try to get that structure as well so you're like you know making sure you're at least getting that one one and done um i'm gonna stop here for questions if there's any hi loylan um i did want to thank you for covering uh the topic so far i think one thing that i found really interesting that you just presented on was the cleaning your equipment i actually never thought of the importance of that and really having it carry over from one garden to another and that causing issues for uh you know the ocean friendly gardens up ahead one question i did have just as far as specifics for the certified mulch that you mentioned you mentioned some sort of documentation for mulch that you know uh, they should be aware of when they're purchasing mm -hmm. mulch for their gardens. Is there any type of terms that you would say that you you know you would look for, or is it just certified mulch that is mentioned? Um, I think you mentioned like the quantity of weeds or certification that there's no um, you know palm fronds or palm seeds of any sort. Right. What is um, the so wording? There there is a there's a a mulch and soil council and they basically give out the certifications to different mulch companies all around and so they'll have this really official looking document i cannot think of the name of it but it'll have pretty much the analytics of everything that could be found in this mulch and then it'll have the perhaps percentage of weed seeds so it should be really low like you know one two percent of weed seeds that are present which is kind of unavoidable but the mulch and soil council that would be the best guidance, I think, for them moving forward as when they're purchasing any or purchasing or installing any type of mulch in their area. Yes. Wonderful. Other than that, I didn't see any questions come in through the chat. That was just a clarification I wanted to get. Thank you so much. Okay. 
so we'll carry on. So not much left. We'll talk about some of the weed problems that we've experienced when we're visiting the gardens, um, the common broadleaf weeds, and then the common grassy weeds, and kind of I'll talk about their life cycle and then perhaps the best time to address them, even though, you know, you kind of constantly have to be addressing them. So um, one weed that I've seen quite a bit, and it's a very common weed, um, especially in turf grass surfaces. And so if your area used to be turf grass, all the weeds that are perhaps a nuisance in turf grass will probably be present because the seeds are still there. So broadleaf plantain, is a perennial weed. Um, what you wanna do is you wanna remove new plantain seedlings if you can um, before they produce seeds because they will produce these seed heads which are like these spike flowers and they'll produce just so many seeds. Um, they are very hard to pull out of the soil especially if the soil is a little on the dry side. Um, and they're also just hard to remove because they grow so flat and prostrate, you may not even see it. Um, but you want to monitor the area for several months after you find them and start removing them to make sure that they don't resprout because they possibly can, even if you just remove the top, they can obviously they can resprout from the bottom portion. So you want to make sure you remove them because they do have an extensive root system that will, you know, be underground. Um, the flowering usually takes place between April and September, so you definitely want to address this before then. And it's such a large flowering window because that's the thing about weeds. They're just really good at living and being alive. They have a competitive advantage on mainly all fronts over um, landscape plants that we desire. So, you know make sure you never let these particular weeds to get to flowering especially but then you also want to think about those underground structures because they are perennial and making sure you kind of getting much most of the vegetative underground part as you can um and there are some things in the soil that certain weeds can indicate and so broadly plantain can indicate that the soil is moist and has low fertility. And so these are cultural things that you can address and they may alleviate the occurrence of these weeds. Then we have dandelions, which are the number one weed in most places. Um, it is a perennial weed as well. It will likely come back year after year and it's um, it reproduces by seeds and the seeds can germinate all year and so um, it's not necessarily that the plant is perennial, much like, you know, how we talk about perennial trees, like it'll go dormant. It'd just be, they produce so many seeds that the seeds will constantly be germinating. So you'll constantly have them popping up. Um, dandelion seeds could travel, making it very difficult. And so this is definitely um, a case where cleaning your equipment. So even if you're going from garden to garden or you're going from another landscape area to the garden, um, you want to make sure you're cleaning as much as possible because in your other landscape area, you may have the um, capacity to use herbicides. And so, you know, that's fine. Use your herbicides, but then you can't use them here. So you have to take more special care to not bring um, traveling seeds to these gardens. Of course, removal must be done repeatedly over a long period of time. Um, you know, once dandelions are there, they're gonna somewhat always be there. So it's definitely something that you wanna um, take care of as soon as you see. Before we get to the point of having this seed head spread its seeds far and wide, you wanna get it when it's still growing prostrate to the ground before it's put up um, flowers or even seed heads. It can indicate acidic, moist, compacted soil. And so these are cultural things that can be addressed. You know, look into the pH. Is the pH um, very low? Is the soil too moist? Is the soil compacted? And so these are basically conditions that dandelions love. And so that's something culture that you can work on. And then there's chickweed, which is um, a, very common winter annual broadleaf wheat. 
it blooms mo mainly in February to September. So that's definitely before you hit February, you wanna make sure that you're dressing these weeds. So around now, um, chickweed definitely needs to be controlled before it flowers because it produces many little tiny flowers that's gonna drop all the seeds. And so once it drops the seeds, you have to, you're guaranteed to have to come back next winter and address this problem. Um, they can reroot from stem, no stem no nodes in moist areas. So basically, this is a case where if you had a weeder and you weeded it down, or even if you're pulling the weeds and you're not like wholly pulling out the bottom parts of the stems, so the underground portion as well, they will reroot and start all over. Even if you weed and you don't clean up the area completely, they can reroot. They're very tenacious. Um, so you want to take care of that as soon as possible. Um, and then they can indicate a slightly moist, compacted soil with low fertility. So these are the places that these weeds would thrive. Um, if your soil has a very low fertility, this is when you want to consider you know, should I be using a compost tea? Should I um, refresh in the compost mulch? Because once again, we can't use fertilizers. Okay, so now we'll talk about the grass weeds, which perhaps are a little bit more difficult to control just by the nature of it being a grass. So Bermuda grass, number one, we, like I said, it's a perennial, it repro it's so, you know, competitive because it can reproduce by seeds stolons which are above ground horizontal stems and then it also has underground horizontal stems which are rhizomes so you know three methods of reproducing and spreading far and wide and you know that's why it uses the turf grass because it can put up with a lot but then that's also why it's a good weed because it can put up with a lot um, you need to have a persistent program of removal so Every time when we visit the gardens, Bermuda grass is one of the main focuses that we're looking at. How much of it can we remove that day without disrupting all the plants around it? We need to pull up all of the stolons and we need to get as many of the rhizomes as we possibly can without digging up too much of the soil. And then of course we wanna get them before they flower. Um, one thing you can do is withhold water during the summer, which is great because we shouldn't, based on you know the irrigation charts that we showed last time a lot of these plants don't really like their water in the summer because they are california natives and that's what they're used to um and so this will kind of dry out the stolons and the rhizomes and this will give the plants a chance to dry back and die out a little bit and so that's a really good time to put efforts into controlling if you can withhold the water in your area without you know neglecting the plants that you desire and Bermuda grass, they love dry, acidic soils. And so that's definitely something um, that you can look into, um, especially like in the winter time. If the soil is dry um, and the pH is really low, they'll thrive in that atmosphere. And then we have annual ryegrass, which is also, um, you know, used for turf grass, but it also is a weed. So. It's an upright annual grass. It behaves more like a biennial or a short-lived perennial um, because it'll drop so many seeds and they'll come back year after year. This is, um, you know, a turf grass that people would plant in the winter so they would have green cover. Um, it grows vigor vigorously in the winter and the spring, so it likes those low temperatures. It flowers in April through September, so if you can pull it out, pull out the little clump of grass before it produces a seed head because that's guaranteed that it's gonna come back and thrive next season. Um, annual ryegrasses, they do like dry and shallow soils with little fertility. So this is something you can also address um, and give your plants the competitive advantage over these ryegrasses. Another one is nut sedge, which is not truly a grass, but it is grass-like. It's a sedge. Um, they are perennial weeds in the sedge family, superficially resemble grasses, but they will be much shinier. And the leaves are shaped in like a triangle when they're coming out. If you ever need to identify the difference between like, you know, a sedge and a grass, they're usually in that triangle shape. 
Um, nut sedges grow mainly from tubers formed in rhizomes, so they'll have these underground stems and they'll have tubers, which are these little um, starch balls that are similar to, you know, tuber potatoes. Um, you can prevent establishment by removing small plants before they develop tubers. So if the plant's really young, it won't have tubers yet. It will usually take the plant a whole season to grow a tuber. The whole point of a tuber is so that when the season changes, it can die back, but then it'll have this underground starch storage. And so when the season changes back, they can use the energy in these tubers and put out more leaves. And so obviously that's what we want to avoid. So pulling out the small plants, but then if you pull out large ones, you wanna make sure that you're getting some of the tubers out of there because they will produce um, new leaves. Um, if you can, once again, let the soil dry in the summer. Withholding water in the summer will also um, starve out the nut sedge. They like a moister soil in the summer. So that's something you can do, once again, without harming the plants that are there. Uh, and they can indicate a moist and compacted soil. So they thrive in these areas. And so if your soil is too moist or too compacted, you may see a lot of nuts edge and that's something that you can address um, with your irrigation and alleviating some of that compaction. And then we have crabgrass, which is also, these are all just huge, huge weed problems throughout the whole entire industry, but also specifically in these gardens. Um, crabgrass is a low growing summer annual. It spreads by seeds. And so each one of these little notches is a seed. So it's going to produce a lot of seeds. Um, you want to control the crabgrass before it sets seed because the seeds for crabgrass are viable for a really long time. So not every weed seed is going to live for 10 years in the soil, but crabgrass, the, weeds are vi the seeds are viable for a really long time. So you know, in the gardens, even we could be dealing with crabgrass that was there when it was a turf grass surface, like I was saying. And, um, you know, we have to make sure that we are kind of on top of it and making sure before we see that seed head, we're removing it. And they are kind of hard to remove um, because they grow so flat. And so this is where a hula hoe will come into play or just a regular hoe. They do indicate a dry soil with low fertility and some compaction, so they thrive in these types of atmospheres. So once again, relieving that compaction um, should help with if you have a really big crabgrass infestation to change your environment where it's not favoring these particular types of plants. And that concludes our webinar series. I wanna leave you with a couple of things on wheat requirements. So one, you want to identify the weeds and learn their life cycles. So it is easy to just say, you know, I'm going to go out to this garden, I'm going to weed, I'm going to pull up all the weeds, which, you know, that's what you want to do ideally, but sometimes it's not possible. So sometimes you have to, you know, have your threshold and choose which weeds you want to focus on at this time because it's not possible to get everything given that you're only there once a month. Um, never use a weed eater or a streak trimmer or herbicides for control, those are not acceptable in these ocean-friendly gardens. And so that's not a route you wanna take. You also wanna clean your tools between gardens or you know, just a general practice to have. It, it makes your life a whole lot easier, cleaning your tools um, between sites in general. You want to remove annuals and biennials before they flower because you don't want to fill the seed bank with more weed seeds. And then for perennials, you want to remove the vegetative structures. So if we're talking about sedges, you're removing those tubers. If you're talking about Bermuda grass, you're removing stolons and rhizomes. And that concludes our wheat requirements. Next time we'll be talking about mulch requirements and we'll get more into the specifics of that certified mulch program. And that would be next Thursday at 10 a.m. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or you can um, email Jennifer. Um, thank you and we hope to see you next time.